everyone. I'm Zara from SDFN Germany. Welcome to the third session of the webinar series, Europe, Our Wide and Safe Space, a series co-organized by SDSN Europe and three SDSN chapters, SDSN Mediterranean, SDSN Portugal, and SDSN Germany. Two webinars have already taken place in April and May, and they presented some inspiring success stories in Europe in the area of sustainable development involving young people. The first one discussed student mobility across the EU and was hosted by SDSN Mediterranean. And the second webinar uh, explored net zero strategies for a greener EU and was hosted by SDSN Portugal. And now we are very happy to welcome you to the third session, Inclusive Societies and Inclusive Institutions within the EU, hosted by SDSN Germany. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm really excited about today's lineup of speakers and the initiatives presented, and I look forward to our discussions. And without further ado, I would like to give the floor to our first speaker for the opening remarks, Dr. Axel Berger, Managing Director of STP in Germany. Axel, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. And uh, thank you very much to the um, whole STSN family for, for bringing us together um, for this very important topic. Um, but before I start with a couple of um, remarks, let me first of all uh, say a couple of words on SDS in Germany. So we represent uh, 50 plus institutions uh, from Germany, think tanks, universities, uh, NGOs, consu consumer organizations, um, and um, economic um, 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 actors, um, uh, business associations, etc. Uh, we bring them together in order to, to jointly engage in, in German uh, public discussions, but also policy discussions to move sustainable development in Germany forward, but also um, through Germany, uh, um, given its uh, yeah, international, international responsibilities as well. Um, with a very crucial European election coming up, uh, today's webinar addresses the relevance of uh, inclusive societies, inclusive institutions, for for shaping a safe, a just, and a sustainable future for all of us. Um, inclusion um, means for us that all people can participate in a social, political, economic life in a self-determined way. And inclusive societies and inclusive institutions in particular entail, for instance, to ensure public access to information, to protect fundamental uh, freedoms, to provide access to justice for all, ensure uh, a needs-oriented, inclusive, participatory, uh, representative um, decision-making uh, at all levels. And often we would refer to SDG 16 uh, in this respect. So this is a key uh, SDG um, uh, in order to discuss these issues. Um, when we talk about inclusion, we cannot forget, though, uh, that there are many barriers, obviously, preventing everyone um, from, from fully participating in political, economic, and social life. And it, that exclusion and discrimination is often based on a multitude of factors like gender, age, location, occupation, race, ethnicity, religion, citizen, citizenship status, disabilities, sexual orientation, and gender identity. And I could go on and on. So this is a re really a multifaceted um, um, issue and challenge and often um, people experience intersectional discrimination. So um, based on several of those factors combined. Um, yeah, and, and the situation in Europe also illustrates this. Young people are very politically active. Um, they are very engaged and often at the forefront of global movements and campaign, campaigns. But although they make up 25% roughly of, uh, the, uh, of Europe's population, very few of our politicians and decision makers are under 30 years old. Um, young people often feel therefore excluded from politics, from decision making processes. They feel that political decisions do not reflect the real realities of young people. Um, we should also not forget a, a third of young people in Europe are at risk of poverty and therefore socially excluded. Um, we also have new migration movements that bring many social and integrational challenges with them. And therefore it's, it's crucial to work to ensure that all young people in Europe, especially those who are most marginalized and excluded, can fully realize their rights. 
Um, but obviously, we also have a lot of success and achievements uh, uh, in Europe um, that are working towards inclusion. And today, we are especially um, happy to have a couple of young representatives, uh, young people to share their achievements and, and their success uh, success stories to, uh, for inclusion, uh, for inclusive societies and inclusive institutions. And we are very, very happy to have such a valuable um, selection of examples of initiatives presented by by uh, young young people, young citizens that show um, us some aspects of a very diverse topic of inclusion. We hope uh, that these achievements inspire all of us, all of you uh, present here online and stand, um, so that you can stand up uh, for inclusion and democracy with regard to European elections and beyond the elections. And with this, I would like to wish all of us a very, very good and fruitful exchange. Thank you very much. Back to you, Salem. Thank you very much for this introduction to today's session, Axel. And now I have the pleasure to pass the floor to Dr. Simone Kresti, who will speak on behalf of SDSN Europe and explain the idea behind the webinar series, Europe, Our Wide and Safe Space. Simone, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you for this invitation. Uh, I speak on behalf of Professor Angelo Riccaboni, which is the co-chair of SDSN Europe and the chair of SDSN Mediterranean. So the idea that stands behind this series of webinar is that SDSN family, as Alex defined just, just now, uh, our, our network, <clears throat> uh, engages uh, with a lot of universities and many students and young people in Europe and all over the world. So we think that uh, um, this is uh, uh, really important uh, reasons that stands behind the possibility of SDSN Europe uh, to, to talk uh, to students, to young people, uh, that uh, uh, with the aim of making them aware that we all are today benefiting of several goals and uh, achievements that the European Union um, get uh, along its long process of development and integration. Therefore, the European elections that uh, are uh, coming uh, um, are the momentum uh, in which uh, uh, we are able to shape the future of the European Union and our societies. Um, therefore, these uh, webinars uh, and this, those discussions, uh, we think that allow young people and students and uh, all of us to put on the table ideas, projects, uh, but also critiques uh, to the European Union that allow us to un better understand how relevant uh, is this, uh, uh, our, our uh, institutions uh, today for our life and for our future. So uh, this is my brief introduction. I thank you again for uh, this invitation and uh, I wish you all a constructive and fruitful discussion about these relevant topics that Alex uh, introduced just before me. Therefore, uh, welcome to everybody. And uh, Sara, uh, the floor is yours again for continuing in the program and the discussion. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Simone, also for your welcoming words and for contextualizing this webinar. And now we will hear our keynote speaker, Annelou Snippe from the European Youth Parliament, a youth-led network that is active in 40 European countries. Annelou is the former chair of the European Youth Parliament's International Youth Board, the governing body. Uh, originally from the Netherlands, she has been a volunteer for the EYP since 2017 as a project manager, journalist, and facilitator at over 25 uh, EYP conferences across Europe. She holds a master's degree in Euroculture and has lived in five European countries, now residing in Berlin, where she works as a project manager on network governance and a project on Arctic youth in the Euro EYP's secretariat. And now she will share the perspective from the European Youth Parliament on including youth in policy making. Annelo, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. I will just quickly share my slides. Um, I already heard uh, some very important 
uh, notes on including young people uh, just now. Um, yeah, so my name is Alalu. I am from the European Youth Parliament. Um, and in this short keynote, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some successes that we see in including youth in, in Europe and in the EU. Um, and then also a little bit about my organization and how we do that. Uh, I'll start with this slide where you see some European politicians uh, with youth. Uh, it's pretty clear that they they know that it's important to be seen with youth, at least. Um, they somehow, it's clear that that Macron, you see him here, that Roberta Metzola, uh, the president of the European Parliament uh, up on the left, and even the president of the European Commission, they all seem to know that youth are important. Uh, and likewise, youth know that young people, that it is important to be involved. Um, just uh, last week, uh, the new Eurobarometer survey came out and it said that 48 of young Europeans stated that they actually have taken charge and have taken action to change society, such as signing a petition or participating in a protest. And 64% of young people intend to vote in the upcoming European elections, which is really a lot more than it used to be. In 2019, less than 50% of young people voted in the EU elections. So I'm actually quite hopeful uh, for youth engagement uh, in Europe. Um, however, we are still the generation um, most likely to be underrepresented in policymaking, uh, leading to decisions that ultimately don't reflect my reality and the reality of young people across Europe. Um, before I share some areas in which uh, I think and a lot of young people think we should have more say in, I want to share a success story. Um, and that is the EU Youth Check. So on January 10th, the European Commission has actually promised to implement the EU Youth Check, uh, which means uh, that they will check all of its policies impact on young people during the design phase already. So they're going to do uh, some kind of impact assessment to see whether or not these policies have um, unwanted adverse effects uh, on young people. This is really a massive step forward for a lot of uh, youth advocates uh, working on youth policy uh, and most notably the European Youth Forum has been working on this for years. Now we'll still have to see how this will exactly work uh, in practice and if it will be designed in a way that is also uh, inclusive for all youth, uh, but hopefully uh, this is already a step in the right direction. Um, but beyond kind of checking all policies on whether uh, youth are included, there are certain policies where a uh, youth uh, perspective is even more important because these policies pertain youth. So just a few examples here on this slide. Um, when it comes to youth rights, for example, there's a lot of older policymakers making policy on youth rights. Uh, this includes uh, economic rights, but also rights to, for example, uh, being remunerated for the internships you do, uh, being remunerated for your work in the same way that people of an older generation are. Uh, education, uh, who are in young, uh, in education, it's young people. Uh, and yet there are policymakers working on this who don't have that same perspective. Um, in the same way, uh, it's youth aren't currently represented in uh, all democratic bodies uh, and in sustainable development. Uh, a lot of policymakers don't realize that the policies they're making uh, impact uh, the world where youth have to live tomorrow. Um, so how can young people become involved? That's kind of where my organization comes in. Um, the European Youth Parliament uh, aims to inspire and empower a young generation of informed, open-minded, responsible, and active citizens that shape society and drive impact. Uh, so we are a network of 36 uh, member organizations uh, in the Council of Europe countries, so not necessarily just the EU. Uh, and together we engage around 28,000 young people a year across 400 plus events, um, all organized and run by youth for youth uh, with around 3,000 uh, active uh, volunteers at a time. Uh, we do this under a set of special principles that some of which are listed here. Uh, so everything is peer led. Uh, it's really um, done by volunteers uh, who uh, learn by doing this, by organizing these events. But also we have youth learn from each other. 
Um, we do this through non-formal education, so outside of the school classroom, where we think young people can learn skills from each other. Um, we're also diverse and inclusive, uh, geographically diverse, and we strive to include youth from different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, rural youth, youth from cities, uh, in this big international network of the European Youth Parliament. Um, we stimulate independent thinking and the exchange of ideas at our events. Young people come together, they discuss European issues. Um, we are nonpartisan, uh, but we empower young people to think about politics and to think about uh, what they can do to change the world around them. This is kind of how we would see the how we would see our organization coming into the world. So we try to make sure that our members, they acquire the knowledge and the skills and the attitudes that will then bring them into political life. And I'm an example of that, actually. Um, back in 2021, I took part in a program called the Ambassadors of the Future of Europe. Uh, and here's where I really learned to hone my own advocacy skills that enabled me to go to the European Commission to talk to a European commissioner and to tell them what I wanted for the future of Europe. So we had 27 young people come together from different European countries and together we wrote a vision on what we think the future of Europe should look like. We went from super technical, like abolishing certain rules that are currently in the European Council or in the European Parliament, to more broader things like we should have education in all member states that is inclusive to all youth. Um, and that way we wrote a little booklet with these policy recommendations that we were then able to take to Brussels. And it is through the European Youth Parliament that I've learned how to speak with policymakers, to speak their language, um, and to be able to bring forward my demands for the future of Europe. Now, I don't necessarily represent the youth and all youth, uh, and I don't necessarily, I'm not currently in an elected position, um, but yet I do think that a lot young people can do a lot more to be engaged uh, with these topics. And I think policymakers can do a lot more to become engaged with youth. Uh, one step forward would be for policymakers to learn to speak the language of young people, rather than young people having to speak the language of policymakers. Um, but uh, I just want to kind of end this little keynote speech with these five pillars again of these specific policy areas that I think youth aren't, uh, that, that specifically pertain youth, that young people should really be uh, more involved in. And lastly, if you think you want to become involved in policymaking and you want more input on this, um, please vote in the European election. Thank you so much, Anilou, for this very interesting perspective from the European Youth Parliament and also for setting the scene for today's webinar. And, and now I would like to hand over to my colleague Tabia Weidenberg from Estes in Germany to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Zara. Hi, everyone. Yes, I have the pleasure to introduce um, three youth representatives who will present their very important and empowering organizations and projects for a more inclusive future in the EU in various dimensions. <clears throat> Each speaker has five minutes and I kindly ask you to stick to the time to allow us more um, time for uh, discussion with the audience afterwards. I also see that the first questions are already coming in. Um, our next guest is Zara Pishnamazade. Pronouns are she, her, and Zara studies international relations in Dresden, Germany. She's a climate activist, campaigner, and organizer with Fridays for Future Germany. She works on Fridays for Future Germany's EU election campaign. We probably all know Fridays for Future. It's a global social movement initiated in 2018 by Greta Thunberg and based on pupils and students around the globe uh, for campaigning um, for comprehensive, rapid and efficient climate protection measures with the ultimate goal of um, climate stabilization and climate justice. And Zara, we are curious to learn more about your online and offline mobilization for the EU election. The stage is yours. Yeah, thank you so much. I will quickly share my screen. 
And I maybe wanted to start with um, quickly saying that what probably distinguishes me or like as a representative of Fridays for Future here is that we as Fridays for Future were not institutionalized and we're a very informal movement that works, you know, with informal networks and only people that it is really easy to just be a part of it. And that's what made it possible to be so big. And even though we are not institutionalized and we are outside of the parliament and all of that, we have had a lot of impact um, on all the climate policy that, that has happened over the past few years. And what I'm going to talk about a bit here is um, what we did in the 2019 EU elections and then also what our plans are um, for these elections and a bit what we've achieved and what the situation is now. So our movement on the streets, you probably all know it, but over the past years, we have mobilized many, many people and we've, had, we've brought millions to the streets on over 9,000 climate strikes only in Germany. And quite recently in January and February, we mobilized over 3 million people against the far right and for democracy in Germany, the democracy protests in under four weeks. Um, so I would say that is um, our most powerful strength that we can just bring people to the streets and mobilize them behind a cause on a very you know broad level of society and that way um, execute pressure on politicians and also impact policy making. And um, now about the 2019 EU elections, what we did there is that we increased the voter turnout. And we can now here see the 2014 um, voter turnout was around 42%. And then we increased it to 50.6%. And that increase, overall increase in voter turnout was almost entirely due to, um, due to the increase in voter turnout in young people, especially 18 to 25 year olds, which you can see here, and also um, 26 to 39 year olds. And what we also did is we made um, climate the number one issue and we put climate on top of the agenda. In 2018, around six months before the elections, a bit similar to now, many people were scared of the far right taking over the European Parliament and everyone thought that climate was going to be a loser's topic. So the parties were thinking if we talk about climate, that's going to lose us votes. And what we did is we mobilized millions of uh, hundreds of thousands of people for climate. And that way we brought what journalists called it the green wave. And that way we basically enabled the Green Deal because we for the first time we have the most ecological European Parliament in history. And um, that, well, forced policymakers, um, like, for example, Ursula von der Leyen, who is, you know, not from the most ecological party, to implement the Green Deal. And now I have some very exciting news, because this was just released yesterday, but the Climate Action Tracker released this block um, entry that since the 2019 elections, the EU's path um, has improved by one degree. And that is only because of the Green Deal. And the Green Deal was because, uh, possible because of our mobilization. So I think that shows quite well how it is also possible to um, have quite a big impact on policy without being you know, present or elected. Yeah, so that was the 2019 elections. And now the situation is looking quite different. Here we can see that the far right has gained ground all over Europe and we're seeing far right parties gaining ground more and more in many European countries. Um, and despite that possible historic gain for far right votes, many young people uh, and progressive voters are currently not planning to vote. So, and we call those people stay at home progressives. Um, and many of those stay at home progressives are also young people. Um, and that is one of our targets groups in this European election campaign. And what is also new is that in Germany for the first time, we can see a clear shift to the right also among young people because classically in the past we could say that as a young generation we would be more you know on average more democratic more pro-climate than the older generation and we had regional elections in Bavaria and Hessen last um, fall and therefore the first time we could see that shift to, towards the right also among young people and experts say that that is because of TikTok. So this is also the third um, new point that I'm bringing here young people are on TikTok and they mainly encounter right-wing content there. Before the regional elections in Bavaria and Hessen, seven out of 10 um, videos that were shown to a new TikTok account were AFD closed um, contents, seven out of 10. And you know, that doesn't mean that the other three videos that a person would be shown are political videos, you know? So it could be one, I don't know what I'm wearing today, one, oh, I really like this dance, and then maybe one progressive political video or even none. 
Um, and that has influenced um, the political opinion of the youth because so many people spend so much time on TikTok in Germany. More than 20 million people use TikTok daily and on average they spend 90 minutes a day on TikTok. And as a movement that is classically strong on the streets, and I've shown you this, uh, it was quite, you know, the unexpected, maybe an unexpected decision to then focus our mobilizing also on TikTok. But we did that because we see a lack of, well, taking this platform seriously, or we've seen that during the past years where progressive forces have not been on TikTok, while the far right has gr gained ground there um, by strategically organizing, um, well, a big platform there where they can reach so many people and influence their political uh, political opinion. So I um, that's why we're now mobilizing and or focusing on our uh, mobilizing online and offline for these elections. I also brought uh, some of our key messages because I thought that's going to be interesting. Uh, but yeah, don't want to say too much, but this EU election is crucial. We all know this. This is why we're here. I mean, some speakers before me have already talked about it, but um, the Green Deal completely is at stake, and we are facing the threat of a full climate rollback if we have a conservative plus and far right majority. So that is what we need to prevent to be able to keep up and save the Green Deal. But you know that, of course, just um, keeping the Green Deal alive isn't enough because we're still not on track. The um, graph I showed you before was uh, showed that um, the EU's current climate path is a bit over two degrees. That is a degree better than what was projected in 2019, but it's still not good enough. So we need to improve the Green Deal. Um, and well, if we think about the 2030 climate goals, this um, parliament's legislator goes until 29, uh, 2029. So, you know, that shows how important it is. And then, of course, the climate crisis is here. Europe is the continent heating up the fastest and is ill-prepared. And that's why we also need climate action here. And many people for a long time thought that we here in Europe as you know, because we're quite privileged and also on average living in richer countries are safe, but that is just not the case. We're not well prepared and we are also the continent where it's heating up the fastest. And then this point is quite important. Young people could decide this election because in many countries, for example, Germany and France, 16 year olds can vote for the first time. And that means that we have the highest number of young voters ever. Um, and well, that makes young voters a crucial force. And then what I already talked about TikTok, this is a TikTok election and that's why we need to take TikTok back from the right. Um, so our campaign is basically a twofold uh, figure. So on the left, you can see our classical strong suit. We will uh, mobilize masses and our big climate strike is happening on the 31st of May, um, where we're gonna take to the streets, not only in Germany, but also in many other countries, for example, Denmark and France and Austria and Spain and Italy are also taking to the streets on the 31st of May. And then also we've started the Reclaim TikTok campaign where we have in the last um, two months gained over 85 million views, which is quite successful. And yeah, that is basically what we're doing. And our aim, of course, is to save the Green Deal, but also to improve it. And yeah, that was it. I'm very happy to hear questions later and thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Zara, for your sharing your very important and crucial work. Um, I look forward to the discussion, also thinking together democracy and uh, sustainability. Let me introduce you to our next speaker. Uh, it's Gaia Ciccarelli. Gaia's pronouns are they, there. Gaia is a research fellow at the Department of Political and International Sciences of the University of Siena. And since 2017, they specialized in non-formal education of human rights and non-formal education through sports with the Outsport program and method. And Gaia contributed to the creation of the Outsports um, toolkit, which supports sports educators in creating and maintaining an inclusive sports community based on diversity of gender identities and sexual orientations and was rec recognized as a best practice by the World Health Organization in 2023. And further, Gaia is an activist for LGBTQIA plus rights and social justice, and they are in charge of educational activities and training for the Siena Committee of, I hope I pronounced that right, ASIGAY. 
Italy's first and largest LGBTQIA plus nonprofit organization. And the project Gaia will present to us is entitled Precious, Promoting Pluralistic Education in European Universities to Combat Invisible Homophobia Related to LGBTQ+. Gaia, we look forward to your input. Uh, hand over to you. Thanks so much, Tabia. Thanks everyone who's spoken before me. So good evening from the University of Siena from Italy. Um, thank you, Zara, for what you've shared before. So we're moving from climate justice to social justice. Um, I'd like to present to you what we've been doing with Precious. Now, this project, um, as Tabia was saying, is mainly related to the invisible discrimination to lesbian, gay, bisexual, intersex, trans, queer, and asexual individuals. What we mean by invisible discrimination is anything that is not overt, uh, that is not explicitly a discrimination. For example, if you also all only have gendered bathrooms, uh, you are in fact excluding anyone who is a non-binary person or cannot, does not want to be recognized in binary bathrooms, just like by making a building inaccessible with only stairs, you are invisibly discriminating uh, folks who cannot use the stairs. Um, now this project started in October, 2022, and will go on until September, 2025. We are five partners, uh, the University of Siena in Italy, OpenCom, which is managing from Arezzo here in Italy, we have the University of Aristotle Thessaloniki in Greece, uh, Jagiellonian University of Krakow in Poland, and Klaipeda University in Lithuania. As you can imagine, uh, these four countries, we still have a long way to go when it comes to the rights of LGBT, LGBT, LGBTQ folks. And that's why it was really important to um, you know, create this partnership. Um, so as I was saying, we have 36 months on the project, and what we've been focusing on are these four work packages. The first one was a report on the invisible homophobia. What we did is collect best practices at a national and international level. We have more than 100 best practices that we have collected, and they're on our website. I will share this in the chat with you, and I will show you our website at the end of my five minutes. Um, after this collection, we also created a glossary. Now, we believe that words can create bridges. They can, you know, uh, shed light into what is unknown. Uh, with this glossary that we've translated into the five languages of the partnership, uh, you can download it and use it as you wish. Um, and after that, we moved into our empirical qualitative research. We did that with a questionnaire and with focus groups. What I really like about this project, and we were saying this before, so much weight is on youth, so much weight in universities is usually on students. What we wanted to do with Precious is to actually divide all of this uh, you know, work, labor, uh, with everyone who is at university, staff, teachers, researchers, everyone has the same right to feel seen and represented within the university. So our questionnaires and our focus groups also focused on these aspects and these individuals who can be LGBTQ, we have no idea and they should feel safe uh, as well. Um, moving on to the next work package, which I think is really crucial, was the framework of competences. So we created a, fr a framework on competences uh, divided into knowledge and skills with three levels, low, medium, and high, in five areas which we believe are very, very important. And Axel touched actually on basically all of them at the beginning, but these focus, of course, on social justice, and it was literacy, intersectionality, uh, the social context, prejudice and stereotypes, and communication. How can we really give out tools that make these five areas, uh, you know, upgraded and to give individuals all the tools to navigate them a little bit better? Um, to do so, we also created an implicit bias test. This is to measure, to try and analyze uh, respondents' attitudes towards uh, implicit bias, personal prejudice towards LGBTQI folks. And this will be taken before and after our training package, which is the next um, work package that we're working on right now at the moment. So we started with you know, desk research, trying to see what the situation is at the moment, a report on invisible homophobia, creating a framework with tools that again, are free to use and download for everyone. And now we move on to what we will be doing at national level and international level. So from February 2025, we will have national training 
um, courses in all universities and a five-day mobilization international training here in Siena. This will be supported by COIL and uh, online pills. We've created 10-minute video pills that tackle on the areas that I mentioned before. And this can also help and spread uh, this knowledge. We were talking about Reclaim TikTok. This could be a way to do so um, outside of social media, of course. And um, the last work package, which is crucial to leave a mark and make an impact for the future, is guidelines and a vademecum that we will be leaving to higher education institutions. And we will be creating this in the summer of 2025. The end of the project will be in September 2025 with the last international conference here at the University of Siena. And I mean, we can see change. We've seen change in the last 18 months. We've seen change in Greece. Uh, we've seen change in Poland. Cross my fingers that we'll see change in Italy as well. Um, so we're very committed to not only um, spread this among universities, but to create synergies and create an, an impact on the world outside of academia. And so I wanna thank you again for this opportunity and I'm open to any kind of questions. I'll just share my screen very quickly um, to show you the website, to show you what it looks like. This is the project, uh, Precious Project website. And as you can see, if you click on product, you can see what we've already um, made available. We have the five languages of the partnership. So anything can be read in English. If you don't speak English, you could have, uh, for example, Italian or Polish or Greek. And this is an example of the framework that we've done. So as you can see, there's a learning outcome. In this case, we're talking about literacy. We have the levels of advancement. We have the knowledge, the skills and examples and in this case, you know, researchers, students, or anyone can not just see what you begin with, but how you can evaluate if you've actually reached your objective. Um, so thanks again, and I give the floor back to Tabia. Thank you so much, Gaia, for sharing your crucial work and introducing your trainings and um, guidelines to us. Let me introduce you to our last guest for today. Uh, it's Lena Wittenfeld. Lena's pronouns are she, her. Lena holds a master's degree in political science in democratic governance and civil society. She is currently writing her dissertation on feminist foreign policy at the University of Bielefeld. And Lena's research focuses on the intersection of political theory, international relations, gender and queer studies. And Lena also volunteers as co-program manager of the Gender and International Politics Program at the grassroots think tank Polis 180. And Polis 180 is a super interesting grassroots think tank for foreign and European policy. It was founded in 2015 by a group of committed young people with very diverse backgrounds, very diverse political standpoints. And today the organization counts over uh, 600 association members, and they aim to be the most innovative think tank and talent factory of and young for young experts. And as an inclusive platform for uh, the organization, enables its members to significantly influence foreign and European policy decisions. And Lena will introduce grassroots think tank as spaces for young uh, youth engagement and inclusive participation. And she will bring examples from the work on feminist foreign policy at uh, Polis 180. Lena, we look forward to your input. Uh, the floor is yours. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much for this super kind introduction and also for uh, already diving a bit into what we do at Polis and uh, also come to our vision. Um, thank you also for inviting me uh, and all the super interesting presentations from from the other two speakers uh, it's amazing how how different engagement can look like and uh, it's really really nice to see that there are so many motivated young people here uh, yeah as said so uh, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, Polis as a grassroots think tank and uh, what is so special or why why is it a grassroots think tank so I, I thought of starting there because it's quite a specific perspective uh, we take as we bring together the grassroots concept and think tank. 
uh, because um, where we come from is that uh, we see that people or young people especially think differently about foreign policy and as a think tank, a grassroots think tank for foreign and European policy, uh, we then thought, okay, what to do about it? Uh, so how can we change it that young people are underrepresented in foreign policy discourses and spaces because those are super exclusive, uh, dominated by a specific group of people. Um, and so, um, a lot of issues and a lot of uh, solutions are also not heard. Um, so uh, we asked, okay, would young people make different decisions? Or how, what can they bring into the discussion if they would be heard, if they would be included? Uh, and that's uh, how POLIS came together. And that's uh, what we do there. So we are trying by applying this grassroots idea to become uh, a platform for inclusive participation. I will give you two examples uh, from my work uh, in the program Gender and International Politics, uh, what it can look like. And uh, by having inclusive participation, we will also want to work transparently. We want to be um, from, we want to work from the bottom up. Uh, we want to enable people to uh, come into polis and be able to share uh, what they think, what they want to do, uh, to bring in their passion and also their uh, innovative ideas. Uh, so it's also a space for growth, uh, like as a collective, but also uh, personally. So um, we want to, yeah, it's kind of a self uh, empowerment, but also empowerment within this room, within the group. Uh, and so uh, we want to become a driver for societal cohesion and also uh, bringing in the young perspective, make it visible as it's not really visible now. And um, yeah, to make, uh, to, to give you two examples about different kinds of participation and inclusive participation, I brought you uh, two examples of our work on feminist foreign policy and related policies. So um, in our program, uh, we have this project uh, that is called Feminist Foreign Policies, an ongoing journey through global uh, policies. And this project came together because the members uh, in our program, but also at POLIS, um, see that it's a very important issue. Uh, so uh, it's it came out of our interest and also out of our desire to bring in the young perspective in this topic. Um, and we, we thought, okay, what, what can we do? How can we um, participate in the dialogue and the discourse concerning feminist foreign policy? And so um, we're using the different uh, formats uh, that we have at POLIS. So uh, here um, you can see on the left side, uh, it's a paper. So we have publications um, we have a paper where we uh, outline from our perspective, okay, why why is feminist foreign policy not at its full potential? What what do we need, and what are our recommendations from our perspective? And then we had a lot of different events, and the project is still ongoing. So you're all invited to join our other events. Next week is another one coming up, and here we try to um, discuss together with experts, activists. Um, other civil society organizations and members, uh, different topics within feminist foreign policy. So for example, uh, on Mexico's feminist foreign policy, Sweden's, uh, we talked about um, France um, or Germany as well. So different countries having feminist foreign policy. And here we try not just to, to have this expert talk, but really to get into uh, a discussion also uh, to critically um, bring in uh, what we think and also what what we want to challenge uh, from our perspective. And also, um, as you can see here, um, we had uh, Europe Cooks, Europa Kocht, uh, so Europe Cooks, it's a special event. Uh, it was on the um, possibility of the European Union to have a feminist foreign policy. Um, and this, um, event uh, format uh, is uh, super important to us because it is a 
super low key way to uh, talk with experts, but also to talk to each other about certain topics and then come up um, together uh, inclusively with possible ideas, solutions or ways to go uh, because we just cook together. And uh, as some of you might have already experienced while you cook, you kind of just talk to each other while you're cutting up veggies and all this stuff. So um, this is um, a super nice uh, way to um, kind of participate into discussions. And um, the second um, form of participation that I brought today, and um, yeah, you can also ask about other stuff, but I just have five minutes. So uh, we uh, are part of two uh, networks. So we do also a policy consultation and um, we are part of the Alliance 3025. So 3025 coming from the Women, Peace and Security Agenda from the United Nations. And here we have consultations. Uh, we do have uh, shared statements and commentaries. So we get together with other civil society organizations and um, because we are not that big and we're not that hurt. And in this exclusive space of foreign policy, uh, we as civil society actors said, okay, let's join our forces, get together, build this room, and then uh, have like put everything in together uh, and go to the consultation. Um, and then we also have um, exchanges with the federal foreign ministry, for example, and meetings and uh, on the right hand side you can see a few examples from our work so uh statement but also uh we are on the conferences concerning feminist foreign policy and um, then we have a civil society network on feminist foreign policy uh, which is a bit different as the alliance is a bit more organized and they are just um, different organizations coming together the network uh, is a bit more informal so also individuals can come in and we discuss and we take this as a platform for exchange and then see what do we want to do together? What perspectives do we want to get out there? Uh, what kind of recommendations do we want to make? And so um, it's really nice also here to see how inclusive participation can look like uh, in different forms and ways. Um, all right, I didn't look at the clock, but I guess I, I have my five minutes. So uh, here you can find our website, our insta you can also contact me but um yeah please just just ask away and i give it back to tabea thank you very much thank you lena i wish i have discovered your organization earlier to be honest <laughs> like super interesting work so uh, we will have some time for q a and all of you received questions so i would like to make sure to uh, raise at least one question to all our speakers of today and so I would start with Annelou. Annelou, there's the question in the chat that the European Youth Parliament is a youth-led educational program and network and that it's active in 14 Euro uh, 40 European countries. You also said that. And the question is, how do you perceive the different successes and challenges of youth engagement in different parts of the continent? Yeah, so for us, it is quite um, yeah interesting to see the big differences we have also in just operating our own NGOs in all of the different European countries. Uh, in a lot of countries where the state is already much more receptive to youth and educational programs, it is much easier for all volunteers to be financially supported uh, and to carry out their activities. For example, if we look at uh, Scandinavia. There we really see that it's much easier for our volunteers to get funding for their activities. They also have more accessible grants um, and in general there's a much more welcoming environment. Whereas on the other hand we also have uh, national committees for example in Serbia uh, and in Croatia and in Georgia where currently in Georgia our uh, volunteers are actually uh, processing in the streets for the right of their organization to even exist when what we do is really nonpartisan political education for young people to talk with each other um in a sense we are not we are not trying to be political ourselves um but even then it is already hard for these organizations to exist uh, similarly our organization has 
unfortunately had to leave Belarus um, as our uh, volunteers there uh, were under they were uh, under extreme circumstances still trying to work uh, together um, but that uh, organization was unfortunately liquidated um, so there you see that there are these extreme differences in within Europe um, between uh, different countries. So it's even more important that we do have this international solidarity and also take care of our of the countries in the European neighborhood uh, when we think of the EU and the European election. Thank you so much, Annelou. The next question goes to Zara from Fridays for Future. Um, Zara, there's the question, how do you mobilize youth to vote for the EU elections in light of the fact that many young people feel especially powerless against the backdrop of the manifold uh, challenges of our time? I would say that is definitely a challenge and I would say it's super important to recognize that feeling of hopelessness and, well, lack of agency that many young people have. Um, in light of the European elections, what we do stress time and time again is that because the um, all like the general voter turnout is lower in the European elections than, for example, in federal elections, and because there are so many first-time voters and uh, much more young voters than usually, we as a young generation can have a bigger impact at the urn. But what we also do stress time and time again is how big the impact of um, our mobilizations on the on the streets are and how, well, I mean, I'd say, especially in times where people many people um, lack hope, it is important to stress how much we've changed already because that is sometimes easy to forget. And it's 2024 and we're at a completely different point than we were at in 2019. And I think it's like, it seems a bit superficial, but if you think about oat milk and cafes as an indicator in Germany, you can now go to any cafe and any supermarket and you will find oat milk. 2019, that was not possible. And of course, our goal is not to, you know, bring oat milk to cafes and to urge everyone to drink oat milk and be vegan because we're not about individual consumerism. But I would say that is quite a good indicator for um, the like, how like we've ecologized society as a whole. And also with the Green Deal, I think the fact that the one degree change that we've made, you know, that we as young people on the streets, many of whom could not even go to vote in 2019, I think it's just telling these stories of su success while at the same time, of course, not wanting to sound too braggy because we also need to recognize that not everything is perfect. And I'd say that's the challenge. Um, and at the same time, I'd say that in Germany, for example, because we have these big mobilizations in, in January and sometimes it just needs, you know, a small moment that tips it and that you know brings the frustration, but then channels like channels that and yeah turns it to action basically. And I think that is possible, and that's the work we have to do. But it is hard. Thank you so much. I completely agree. Thank you. Um, we received a question to Gaia as well. Gaia, in your presentation, you touched upon the intersection between human rights, social justice and systemic discrimination. And the question is, which power structures keep this discrimination or these discriminations, several, alive? And what can we do as citizens and communities to get some of this power back and redistribute it more equally? Thank you. It's a very complex question, but um, I think of course, if we know that um, the first power structure is the state. So I'm not going to make a, a big radical speech here, but we do know that with the urns uh, right around the, the corner, what we can do is, first of all, remind everyone that, especially in the case of lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, intersex individuals, this is a human rights issue. This is not a love is love issue. This is a human rights issue. So this is about human life. And so, first of all, stop voting for people who do not care for human life. <laughs> I know that that is pretty much uh, useless to say at this point, but to, of course, uh, in that situation, give more space um, and, and more voice to those who do value all human life and pluralistic societies, because I think this is what the EU is about and what it's always been about. And we want to keep, keep this alive. 
The other, uh, I think, uh, aspect of it is just like we saw with mobilization um, with Fridays for Future is a lot can be done in the streets. So if the system doesn't want to change uh, in the usual ways, there are other ways to put social pressure, to put pressure on changes that are needed now. We cannot wait in five years, we cannot wait in 10 years, but they're needed now. And so I definitely believe that if we see it as a collective care issue, it's not, if it, if it doesn't regard you, but it might be your neighbor, it might be your friend. So it's a human rights issue again. And I think if we change the view on that and we start to see that just like climate change affects everyone, not just those who are, uh, you know, under heat and more rain and, and we're fine in our apartments with our AC. Um, it's about the fact that you might be okay because you're in the status quo, but many, many people don't even have access to healthcare because states like Italy, unfortunately, do not give access to healthcare to trans individuals. So to the streets, if the errands don't work, that's my two cents. Thank you so much, Gaia. Uh, I do have a question which was raised in the very beginning of our webinar, probably goes to um, all of you, but I would um, raise it to Lena, maybe you would want to answer and maybe also others want to jump in. Um, the question is, what indicators or metrics could be used to assess the inclusive, uh, inclusive inclusivity of societies and institutions at nationals or supranational levels. I don't know if you have work uh, work on metrics and indicators and can maybe share some of like your recommendations. Okay, I think you can go because we don't work explicitly with those. So maybe if you have an insight, uh, please go ahead. Sure, uh, everyone feel free to jump in. I mean, um, of course, any kind of survey or work done, for example, by the Fundamental Rights Agency of the EU just came out 2023, uh, more than 100,000 respondents from 30 countries. Um, this is a metric that can be used. So. For example, in their survey, um, we've learned that in Italy, 18% of respondents, uh, un unfortunately, were victims to reparation and conversion therapies, which in the EU is considered torture. So this can, you know, if one in five individuals, respondents from Italy has been a victim of that, we can definitely say that we have a long way to go. Um, we also have the ILGA Europe rainbow map. This, of course, is in terms of the work that I do, which gives us, you know, rating and metrics. Um, Italy is now uh, ranked 36th among all the countries. That is definitely a metric that you can use. If you were, for example, from Malta, you would be number one. You can say, wow, this is great. We're doing fine. Let's see what we can uh, do to, to, to get better. If you're 36th, then <laughs> there's a long way to go. But there's lots of material and resources that are available also on the Council of Europe website. Um, I would say, you know, anything that is qualitative or quantitative um, is a great way to start. If anyone wants to chip in, of course, feel free. Thank you, Gaia. Otherwise, um, I know it is already four, but I would love to ask all our panelists one question. Please be very brief but I would love to hear the answers. Um, if you could give the audience one message they can take home, what would it be? Sarah. I would say we all see the projections and we see surveys of um, a rise of the far right. But I think what we should never forget is that elections are a choice and that choice is one that most people take in the last 48 hours before the election. So that choice is not made yet and we can still change so much. And let's not forget that. Thank you. Lena, would you like to go next? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I, I totally agree with you, Sarah, on the elections. And maybe also that 
the impact doesn't have to be the biggest impact right from the beginning. So you doesn't have to go to the parliament. You doesn't have to go to uh, the commission right away. So maybe the impact is just to kind of create this inclusive room for people to come to come together to discuss um, to also see that okay we're struggling together so let's acknowledge that we need new solutions and then kind of think about those solutions and then try to think about how how you can make it hurt um because uh yeah as as we have also talked about now and as uh, guy also pointed out these structures are just super hard to break so i think we have to do it step by step and also see that these small steps lead then to change uh, even though it sometimes feels like we're going backwards, it it is always some some uh, going forward uh, in those rooms. Thank you so much, Lena. Gaia, I see your hand. Yeah, just wanted to say I think what we've heard from not just Anna Lou, Lena, but also Zara is that uh, things work. That you have to trust the process. Uh, I want everyone who is here with us to know that they matter, that they are seen, and what they want to implement uh, is legitimate and has the right to be heard. Um, I think what my key takeaway was from Zara's presentation, just five years, which can seem like a long time, but if we look back and everything that's happened in the last five years, it flew by um, to really contextualize everything. So, you know, looking at five, 10, 15 years can look really scary just contextualize it into one, two, three years. And I'm sure you'll be more, um, you'll feel like it can really happen if you, again, trust the process, even at a smaller, on a smaller scale, mm -hmm. because anything you do matters. It doesn't, doesn't have to be the change of the university policy in six months. If you get to change something in your class, among your peers, it's still change. Thank you. Anna Lou. Oh, I really agree with the, the other three speakers just now. And now I have the task of saying the, the last words. Um, I would say be persistent and be loud. Um, it takes a while for change to be implemented. Um, but as you see, even the European Commission listens after a while, uh, but it takes some time. And when you go vote in the European elections, think about the world around you um and the people around you thank you so much i wish we could discuss longer but it's already past uh four o'clock uh thank you so much all of you i will hand over to zara um for the final words thanks thank you tabea and thank you to all our panelists um, I'm trying to be very uh, brief. <laughs> so um, today's session has shown the diversity of en active engagement of young people for inclusive societies and institutions within Europe. And to wrap up this webinar, I would like to highlight three key takeaways. So first, there has been progress on inclusion in Europe. However, uh, it is still not fully achieved and there are many barriers preventing that everyone can fully participate in political, economic and social life. And secondly, actively engaging young people is necessary and crucial for any progress towards inclusive societies and institutions. Um, the initiative, initiatives presented today show that youth plays an indispensable role in shaping safe, just and sustainable futures for all of us. So we should celebrate those success stories in Europe, uh, which are often overlooked, and we should help shape an environment so that these success stories can, can become the norm. And lastly, as Sky also just said, we can all contribute to more inclusive, sustainable societies by showing awareness of and interest in each other's needs, by respecting each other's rights and by listening to each other. And every voice and every action that advocates for just and sustainable futures for all has a very important impact on making our societies and institutions more equitable. And with this in mind, I want to conclude by thanking all panelists of this webinar for their very valuable insights and their engagement for inclusion within and across societies and institutions in Europe. And also a big thank you to all the participants in this webinar for your interest, your attention and engagement and the discussion. And of course, many, many thanks to the SDSN team for your support in organizing this webinar. Have a great afternoon, everyone.
Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye, thank you.